Jordan River. Good morning, saints, and welcome once again, friends. Friends, as the old preacher once said, I'm not going to hold you long, but for the next few minutes, I am going to try to hold you strong. Not going to keep you long today, friends. Friends, today the world is celebrating Easter, but they're calling it Resurrection Day, the day Jesus rose from the grave. Friends, this is cause for concern. Conflating two different events in history and calling them the same thing clearly demonstrates a misunderstanding of the scriptures, God's word. It also shows us man's ignorance and the depth of his willful contempt towards God in commercializing, exploiting, and diminishing the importance of uh, the Lord's death. Sadly, many today misunderstand, disregard, disrespect, and dismiss God's gift of love to us. Friends, sometimes we get so caught up in the traditions of the world that we ignore the commandments of God. Some people know very little about who and what they worship, and therefore they say and do things that have a form of worship, but are not acceptable to God. Let me help somebody today. Friends, God wants a relationship with us. But to be in a relationship with God, one must understand and obey God's commands. Jesus spoke of this when he said in John chapter number 4, uh, quickly run. I know you got on your spiritual running shoes this morning. John chapter number 4, around verses uh, 22 through 24. There Jesus said, we're supposed to know what we worship. He said, God wants true worship from us. Jesus said, true worshipers must worship the Father in spirit and in truth. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Friends, Jesus is telling us the Father wants us to worship him with knowledge and understanding, not ignorance and meaningless, pretentious, theatrical performances. Clearly there's a misunderstanding uh, of what Easter means and how it's to be remembered. Just to be clear, the Jews celebrated the festival Easter, which in the original Greek was called Pascha. P-A-S-C-H-A. Pascha. It's a transliteration of the Arama Aramaic word and the correlating Hebrew word Pesach. P-E-S-A-C-H, which means to hop over or pass over. The Pesach or Passover meal was instituted by God to proclaim his passing over uh, the doorposts of the homes of the children of Israel when they were in Egyptian bondage. The meal consisted of a uh, a, a, a male lamb without blemish, not more uh, than a year old, roasted. It was to be roasted in fire, eaten with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. It was to be eaten before morning, and anything left over was to be burned in the fire. And the Lord commanded the children of Israel to mark their doorposts with the blood of the Passover lamb. Any home not marked with the blood of the Passover lamb would have its firstborn killed by the destroyer. But look, I don't want you to take my word for it. Quickly, run. I know you got on your spiritual running shoes. Turn to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Uh, when you get there, stop at chapter number 12. The book of Exodus. 
It is where we shall meet at the book of Exodus. The chapter is 12. And I'll just pick it up at verse number 3. Where the Lord speaking to Moses told him to speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, On the tenth of this month every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father. A lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next to his house take it according to the number of the persons. According to each man's need, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the door, on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. Then they shall eat the flesh on that night, roast it in fire with unleavened bread and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat it raw nor boiled at all with water, but roast it in fire, its head with its legs and its entrails. You shall let none of it remain until morning, and what remains of it until morning you shall burn with fire. And thus you shall eat it with a belt on your waist, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. So you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Now behold, the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So this day shall be to you a memorial, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it as a feast by an everlasting ordinance. So we understand, friends, through Scripture, what Passover, the Passover, and the Passover feast are. Today, many so-called Christians are celebrating Resurrection Day, the day Jesus rose from the grave. But they're calling it Easter, which means the Passover. Y'all see a problem with that? Let's look again uh, at the book of Luke. Quickly run. The book of Luke. I know you have on your spiritual running shoes. The book of Luke. Uh, let's turn to Luke chapter number 24. Luke, the chapter is 24. And when you get there, let's begin at verse number 1 and we'll terminate at verse number 9. Luke chapter 24 beginning at verse number 1, terminating at verse number 9. The scripture reads, Now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, 
The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. So we see, friends, that the Passover and the Lord's resurrection are two different events in history. Clearly, they're not the same, not even remotely close. But across religious faiths, many have mixed these two events, not understanding what they're celebrating. Friends, if the people don't understand what they're celebrating today, they cannot appreciate the sacrifice Jesus made for us. So how fitting that on this day called Easter, the Passover, when many are celebrating bunny rabbits, searching for Easter eggs and dressing up to parade down the aisles, we recognize Jesus, the Son of God, who died and rose to take away the sins of the world. Friends, today we just want to share the good news about Jesus. We want to tell everybody about a Savior who was unjustly accused, tried, and murdered. But it was God's plan all along that he would die and be buried in a borrowed tomb and on the third day rise again with all power. Friends, we just want to tell people the truth. That Jesus rose to fulfill God's word and his will, giving us an opportunity and an invitation to salvation and the hope for eternal life. Friends, Jesus rose because he loves us. Thus, my sermonic proposition for your intellectual consideration this morning is, Love is risky, but you are worth it. Love is risky, but you are worth it. Friends, as the Apostle Paul prepared for his journey to Rome, he took his eternal pen in hand, and by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he wrote to the saints in Rome and to us, to give us instruction in the faith, provide clear, essential uh, uh, Christian principles, and declare the greatness of God's love. Paul tells us God's love is given to the undeserving, the unjust, and the undesirable. And he emphasizes that God loves the weak, the lost, and the unrighteous. God loves the weary, the helpless, and the hopeless. God loves the wayward, the wicked, and the defiant. And I suppose it might be all of us today. Friends, Paul wanted us to know that we are in desperate need of spiritual love from on high. And he wanted us to know that God's love is greater than anything we've ever known. Anything we've ever known. God loves us too much to leave us in our wretched condition. Friends, there's no greater proof of God's love. It cannot be disputed on earth or in heaven that the ultimate demonstration of God's love was the death of his son on the cross for sinners like us. The Apostle Paul tells us in verse number 6 of our scripture reading, Romans chapter number 5, verse number 6. Paul said, when we were without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Friends, when we were caught up, trapped, held captive and in bondage to sin, gone astray, turned out and in love with this world, Without help and without hope, degenerates corrupted by selfish ambitions, 
blinded by pride, consumed with worldly pleasure, stained by the filth of rebellious living, reeking of the putrid sin of death, and destined for destruction according to God's righteousness. When we were hanging out on Broadway, doing things our own way and rejecting God's way, when we thought we knew more than the Encyclopedia Britannica, when we slept all day and crept all night, when we chased a life that we should have been running from, when caviar dreams had us taking penitentiary chances, when we rebelled against mama and daddy and wouldn't listen to anybody, nobody could tell us anything just like some of us today. When we were in such bad shape that we wouldn't have taken a chance on ourselves. When we were justly condemned because of our evil conduct and contempt for God. And there was absolutely nothing we could do to free ourselves from God's wrath to come. When we needed a Savior, Jesus showed up stepped up to free us. He took our punishment by sacrificing himself. First Peter chapter 2 verse number 24 tells us Jesus bore our sins in his own body on a tree that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness. By his stripes we were healed. Friends, Jesus died for the sins of the world. His death revealed our hatred for God. But it also revealed God's eternal love for us. Thank you, Lord. Friends, there's no love like God's love. I'm trying to tell somebody this morning that love is risky. But you are worth it. You're worth it. Verse number seven of our scripture reading, uh, there the apostle Paul tells us, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man one would even dare to die. Friends, to have a chance, sometimes we need someone to take a chance on us. All of us are sinners and come short of the glory of God. There's nothing righteous and nothing good in a sinner. Nothing at all. Sometimes we think so much of ourselves that we can't appreciate what the Lord has done for us. Jesus gave his life to give us a chance at life. He never sinned against God, but he bore our sins that we could be made Right with God. He voluntarily took our place. 1 Peter chapter 3 verse 18 tells us the just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. Friends, here's a news flash. We are the unjust. The unrighteous. The ungodly. Sinners. But love made Jesus take a chance on us. Thank you, Lord. Love is risky, but you are worth it. Friends, we can be difficult to love. It's not easy to take a chance on some of us. Some of us just ain't no good. I'm going to keep it 100 with you. I'm going to keep it real. Some of us just ain't no good. And we know we ain't no good. We're rotten to the core. Some of us look for a chance just to prove that we shouldn't be given a chance. Help us, Lord. If good were the only thing to be, some of us would try to be something else. Help us, Lord. Our every thought is evil. Friends, we ought to thank God that he's not like us. We can be unforgiving. 
Many of us would never give others the chances that we've been given. Help us. If left to some of you, I would never be given a chance. And I probably wouldn't take a chance on some of y'all either. Help us, Lord. But love says, give them another chance when we know we shouldn't. When we want to retaliate for the harm he's caused, love says, don't do that. Bear with him. Love says, be patient with him when we've had enough. When we know we're being taken advantage of, love says, help him. I know he's lying, but give it to him anyway. Love says, take him back when you know you shouldn't. Love says, I know he's no good, but one day he'll make a change. When you start hearing rumors about him, love says he's not as good as some, but he ain't as bad as others. When you find out how the money's being spent, love says he's not a bad person. He's just, that thing just got him. When he did something that really hurts you, love says forgive him. He didn't know any better. When he turns his back on you, love says, don't turn your back on him. He needs you. When you're not getting through to him, love says, keep trying. Don't give up on him. When you've given him a, a second, a third, and a fourth chance, love says, he just needs another chance. When you come to the decision that you can't give him another chance, love says, remember how many times the Lord forgave you. When you question why you stayed as long as you have, endured as much as you have, taking as much as you have, giving all that you have, and you still keep coming up on the short end. Love says, I know, I know it's risky, but he's worth it. Friends, some of us just need another chance. And without Jesus, we would be nothing, absolutely nothing. Thank God that Jesus didn't give up on us. He didn't take the easy way out. When Pilate questioned Jesus about his deity and his kingship, he could have simply said what Pilate wanted to hear and been released, let go, free. In fact, he didn't even have to answer Pilate's questions. He could have simply called 12 legions of angels to rescue him. Friends, I'm trying to tell you that he didn't have to do it, but he did. Because we are worth it. We mean something to Jesus. So he stayed the course. He fought the good fight against sin and death. And endured the shame of the cross to save us. Friends, nothing good comes easy. And Jesus didn't, uh, uh, didn't do what some of us would have done. He didn't take the easy way out. He didn't take the easy way out. He only considered how much he loves us. And he allowed himself to be lied on. He suffered for our lives. He endured a sadistic abuse, allowing himself to be spat upon, mocked. And brutally beaten, taking lashes that ripped the flesh from his body and would have killed the average man. And with each savage blow, I can imagine Jesus just looking down, looking at us, thinking of us, and saying to us, 
I'm doing this because you sinned against God. It was your sins. I left my home in heaven and my throne next to God. The sanctuary of peace, safety, and comfort. I did it because of your depravity. And I'm going through this because of your corruption. I'm doing this because of your imperfections. I'm doing this because of your immoralities. I'm doing this because of your addictions. I'm doing this not because I owe God anything, but because you owe the price that you couldn't pay. I've been convicted for your crimes. Your pleasure has caused me much pain. I'm being murdered because you are a murderer. Your faults, your reproaches, your shame, your dishonor, your disgrace, your degradation, your offenses, and your sins have fallen on me. I've taken them all and laid them on myself. I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for you. Because you are worth it. I'm risking everything for you. I'm giving my life for yours. Friends, he didn't have to do it. I'm telling you, he didn't have to do it. But he did. He could have taken the easy way out. But he didn't. He didn't do that. Why? Because you are worth it. Many are looking for an easy way to heaven. They're relying on Big Mama and Pop Pop's faith. Mama and daddy's faith. And in the end, they're hoping for and counting on God's mercy and his grace. Look at our scripture reading. Look at verse number 8, Romans chapter 5, verse number 8 of our scripture reading. There, God tells us that he's already extended his mercy and his grace toward us. Verse 8 said he demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Friends, when God sent Jesus to die for us, he extended his mercy and his grace. Mama, Pop Pop's faith won't do you any good in the end. Prayer won't save you in the end. All the good deeds you've done won't get you into heaven. God's word tells us that we must work out our own soul salvation with fear and trembling. Friends, if you want to be where God and Jesus are, you got to step out on your own faith. Your own faith. Only faith in Jesus and obedience to his gospel message can save you. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Finally, friends, in verse 9 of our scripture reading, I told you I wasn't going to keep it long. Verse 9 of our scripture reading says, We are justified by his blood and saved from the wrath of God through Jesus. Friends, there's no other way in. Love is risky, but you are worth it. Friends, what the world needs now is a whole lot of love. Love, sweet love. Many languages are spoken in the world. But across cultures, nations, and continents, love is perhaps the most universally understood. I believe the language of love is, 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 is not something we speak. Love is expressed, communicated, and demonstrated through our actions. Love will make us shower a person with roses, gift them 
uh, expensive things and make promises that we sometimes can't keep. Help us, Lord. I'm reminded of a song by a famous singer in which he professes the many things he would do for his love interest. He says, if this world were mine, I'd place at your feet all that I own. You've been so good to me. If this world were mine, I'd give you the flowers, the birds, and the bees, and the old love inside me. That would be all I need. If this world were mine, I'd give you anything. And in her response to his, uh, 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 in her response to his love interest, she says to him, if this world were mine, I'd make you a king. With wealth untold, you could have anything. If this world were mine, I'd give you each day so sunny and blue. And if you wanted the moonlight, I'd give you that too. If this world were mine, I'd give you anything. And at the end of the song, they both profess to each other that the world would be yours. The world would be yours. Powerful words used to convey, to convey indescribable love. Friends, many of us have taken the risk of loving someone, but not like Jesus. Not like Jesus. Recently, after a foolish uh, after foolishly uh, uh, trying to describe the overwhelming uh, uh, influence love sometimes has on us, another famous celebrity said, love will make you do some crazy things. And friends, he's right. Many of us have done things we might not otherwise do, if not for love. But I submit to you there is nothing we've done or will ever do that compares to what God has done to demonstrate his eternal love for us. Friends, God does a most unusual thing. He loves people who do not love him. God loves people who do not love him. Not many of us are conditioned to do that. We love those who love us. The Apostle John tells us in 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 10, that real love, real love is loving those who don't love you. John says this is real love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a propitiation, a conciliation, an appeasement, a sacrifice to take away our sins. Friends, God loves us so much that he gave us his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Friends, I, 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 I like how the Bible expresses God's love for us. It expresses an unimaginable love with indescribable gifts, mind-blowing promises, and an eternal union with God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 9 tells us that I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 tells us, God our Father has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 4 through 6 tells us God is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. 
and saved us by his grace and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Oh, I love God's love. The apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 8 verses 38 and 39, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Oh, I love God's love. And Jesus told us in Luke chapter number 12, verse number 32, it is our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. Oh, that's the kind of love I want. Y'all can have worldly love. You can have worldly love. I want real love. I want heavenly love. I want God's love. Friends, it's good to recognize the Lord's resurrection. But before he died, or, 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 but before he could be resurrected, he had to die. On the eve of his crucifixion, he specified that he always wanted us to remember his death. It's in your Bible. It's in your Bible, I'm telling you. If you turn to the book of Luke, run quickly uh, to the book of Luke, uh, uh, chapter number 22. Stop around verse number 14. Look down verses 14 through around verse number 20. After the Lord had blessed the bread, signifying that it was his body, and the fruit of the vine, identifying it as his blood to be shed, he said, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. He told us to honor his death. By, part, by partaking of this commemorative meal, which we today call the Lord's Supper or communion. The Apostle Paul reminds us in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verses 25 and 26. Quickly run, look. Again, uh, Paul says that we are to remember the Lord's death, memorialize it, continually declare it, so it's the Lord's death, friends, that we are commanded to observe today. Friends, never forget the Lord's resurrection. Don't ever forget it. But had he not gone to that cross and died for our sins, there would be no resurrection. And if no resurrection, we would all still be dead in our trespasses and sins. Love is risky, but you are worth it. That's my message on this morning, friends. Love is risky, but you are worth it. Friends, if you haven't obeyed the life-saving gospel of Christ, your situation is critical. You're in the midst of an emergency. Your soul is at risk. You need the life support that only Jesus can provide. If you've heard the gospel, now you must believe it. Jesus died, was buried, and rose from the grave with all power. If you will simply believe this, place your faith in it, and demonstrate your faith through, the, through uh, obedience to his gospel message, you can have your sins removed and take your place in God's kingdom today. Right? Repent of your sins. You know you're not living right. Make up your mind that you want to live right before God. Confess that you believe Jesus is the son of the living God. And finally, according to Acts chapter number 2, verse number 38, you must be baptized. You must be baptized. Which is a total bodily submersion in water in the name of Jesus. For the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the precious gift of the Holy Spirit identifying you as a child of God. Friends, you will rise a new creature in Christ having made the proper exchange death
for life and live the rest of your life knowing that you are worth something to God. Friends, why don't you establish a relationship with God according to the scriptures today? Please notice the numbers that are scrolling at the bottom of the screen. Notice the email. Call us. Text us. Email us right now. Our operators are standing by. If you have a prayer request, send us your prayer request. Call us. We want to pray with you and for you. Friends, don't allow this opportunity to pass you by. We want to help you embrace the Lord's sacrifice and take your rightful place in God's kingdom. It will save your soul. I'm Oh, my.